of the Fordson was based more on its reputation than the merits of the machine. Gas Powered Magazine wrote in 1916, nothing spectacular or unusual in its performance. Most would have taken the machine without question, just because it was built by Henry Ford. Today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the Henry Ford slash Harry Ferguson deal. And then I'm gonna get right into a bunch of advertising and literature for Ford tractors because Ford tractors are pretty high on my list of tractors that I like. I don't have any, but uh, my brother-in-law has a bunch over there on the dairy farm. So uh, something I'm familiar with, something I like, and we'll go talk about some of these different things that, that transpired to make the three-point hitch what it is today and why that's the hitch that everybody uses instead of one of the proprietary ones that we've talked about earlier. So stick around for a few minutes and let's take a look at these hitches, a little bit of history, and then some While the market was ready for a new tractor, Ford still wanted to experiment and refine. His tinkering was stopped by the U.S. declaration of war in 1917. If you're a tractor guy like I am, you've probably heard about the famous handshake agreement between Harry Ferguson and Henry Ford. It's very well documented and it's, it's actually quoted and Harry Ferguson bluntly told Harry Ford who at the time in 1938 was possibly the richest man in the world that you haven't got enough money to buy my pens. So Ford said well you need me as much as I need you so what do you propose? And Ferguson said well a gentleman's agreement. You stake your reputation and resources on this idea. I stake a lifetime of design and invention. No written agreement could be worthy of what this represents. If you trust me, I'll trust you. It's a good idea, said Ford, and with that the two men stood and shook hands. Henry Ford launched the Fordson tractor in November of 1917, and it was the first lightweight, inexpensive, mass-produced tractor in the world, and for the first time, the average farmer could buy and own a tractor. The heritage of the Ford tractor was set with the Fordson, which was built by Ford in the United States. It was built between 1918 and 1928 in the United Kingdom and until 1946. The most revolutionary feature of the Fordson was that it lacked a conventional frame. Instead, the cast iron transmission and axle housings were all bolted together to form the structure of the tractor, and within a few years this feature was copied by others. The Fordson had a 20 horsepower, four-cylinder engine, a three-speed spur gear transmission, and a worm gear reduction set in the differential. Because high-ratio worms set generally transmission rotation from the worm element to the gear element, no brakes were provided on the early Fordsons. All you needed to do to stop was to press the clutch. The Fordson was, however, conceived merely as a replacement for a team of horses. Horse-type implements were attached to the tractor by a length of chain, and the draft clevis was attached to the tractor's differential housing high enough for the implement to provide downward pull to give added traction. This was common practice for tractors of that day, but it caused many backflip accidents when the plow or another attachment hit an obstruction. Under these circumstances, the rear wheels wouldn't slip because of the downward pull of the implement, so the tractor reared up and flipped over backwards. The high engine speed coupled with the heavy engine flywheel and the inability of the wheels to slip caused the rearing action to be so rapid that drivers had no time to react. Often, drivers were pinned to the ground, they sought to till. As with everything else, Harry Ferguson's three-point hitch design went through a lot of trial and errors before he finally decided upon the one that you see today, which is two lower draft lengths and a top link. Initially, it was upside down, kind of like the Alice Chavez snap coupler with the third prong on the downside, but he changed it. And then he had some issues with getting it to lift because there was a mechanical lift and then he worked on draft control. He had all these things put together but he didn't have a tractor to put it on. Harry Ferguson was able to get the David Brown Company, an implement manufacturer in Great Britain, to supply a lot of the parts to build his tractor which he called the Black Tractor. And it never really took off even though it was okay and it was disappointing and then by the time it was coming out it was about the time that the Great Depression hit so he didn't sell very many of them. Well, Ferguson had worked really hard to develop a hitch system 
that would prevent the rear and over of tractors, which was pretty common at the time. And in 1916, he launched it, but it was the same time that Henry Ford came out with the, the Fordson tractor, so he didn't have very much luck selling the, his system. The sales were so low and they were unprofitable, and next thing you know, there was a disagreement that was erupted between Brown and Ferguson. Brown wanted to build a bigger tractor, and Ferguson wanted to increase production to the point where the price could be lower, and building the inventory until sales developed. When the two reached an impasse, Brown began making changes that he deemed necessary in 1938. Ferguson sailed for America, and he thought he would demonstrate it to Henry Ford. Henry Ford never really wanted to stay in the tractor business. Like I said, they wanted to close the tractor plant to build Model A's, and by then, the Ford tractor, the Fordson, was so outdated, the sales of it were abysmal. Henry Ford invited Harry Ferguson to come meet with him, and Harry had brought a small hand demonstrator of his Ferguson Brown tractor and with his system on it. Ford was impressed. So starting in 1938, they came out with a prototype, which was going to be called the 9N, the 9 being for 1939, which was when it was going to come out. And they sold over 10000 that first year with a launch price of $585. It included rubber tires, electrical system with a starter generator, battery, and a power takeoff, and optional headlights. This was different because most trackers at the time didn't include these. The engine was a four-cylinder L-head type with 120 cubic inches of displacement. 3.187 by 3.75 inch bore and stroke and a 6 to 1 compression ratio which produced 28 horsepower at 2000 rpm. It was remarkable for the time because it had a standard large capacity cartridge type oil filter, an oil bath air cleaner, and also unusual and much appreciated was the automotive type reverse flow muffler. Most of the tractors during that time they had a magneto ignition and the 9N had a direct driven Distributed with an integral coil. The magneto ignitions of the 30s were cantankerous, troublesome and often included kick back into the hand crank resulting in a broken arm. Needless to say, the modern ignition system and self starter were welcomed. Now the introductory low price of $585 was by design. At that time, Ford figured out that it cost $590 to buy either a team of horses or a team of mules or whatnot plus the harnesses, and then you needed 10 acres of land to, to feed them on, so he figured it was about $590. So he told his team, you got to come up with something that's going to make the farmers want to buy this cheaper than it would be to buy all this other stuff. So they put it all together in $585, so they had $5 left over to spare. Due to wartime restrictions, Ford came out with a, a, two, a 2N in 1942, and it was basically a 9N that was stripped down. It had a magneto and steel tires and whatnot. The demise of the handshake agreement came around 1945. Henry Ford was 82 years old then and he resigned and then his grandson Henry Ford II took his place but it had become obvious to many in Ford management that Ferguson held the clean end of the argument stick. And much of the risk and investment were on the tractor end of the bargain. And while tractors were provided to Ferguson at a fixed price, Ferguson did not offer a fixed price through the dealer network. So he could raise both the dealer prices and the tractors and the price of equipment, and Ferguson also stood to profit the most from the sale of parts and service. So in late 1946, Henry Ford, too, told Ferguson that the handshake agreement would end in 1947 because Henry Ford was dead, so therefore it was null and void. So they put out a new tractor, which would come out in 1948, which was the 8N, 8 being for 1948, and hit the dealer's showrooms in July 1947. It was an immediate success with almost 40,000 units being produced by the end of the first year. And Ferguson, in 1946, had begun the manufacture of his version of the 2N in Coventry, England, called the TE-20. When he realized he was being shut out at Ford with remarkable speed, he set up a manufacturing operation in Detroit to make a U.S. version, the TO-20. And both were dead ringers for the 2N, even though the paint color, but four-speed transmission made them competitive with the 8N. The next thing Ferguson launched was a lawsuit. So six years later, in 1952, the suit was settled with an award to Ferguson for just less than $10 million. 
Over 200 lawyers had taken part trying to sort out the complexities of the handshake agreement, and the main combatant against Ferguson case was the success of his new tractor, applied the damages for loss of business claim. Ford made some changes to the aid end to evade the patents, but the settlement was mainly for infringements. The next tractor, the Ford 1953 model NA Jubilee, had many changes in the hydraulic system and other areas as ordered by the court. So the new Ford Model 8N tractor was introduced in July 1947 and it was a classic engineering masterpiece. The 1948 model, hence the 8N designation, was one of the most popular tractors ever produced. Improvements over the 9N and 2N models were numerous. A slightly more powerful engine was used with the compression ratio increased from 6 to 1 to 6.5 to 1. Otherwise, the engines were basically the same. But later, a side mounted distributor, a separate coil were provided, replacing the integral unit under the fan. A four speed transmission, much needed improvement, added greatly to the tractor's flexibility and productivity. First and second overall ratios were the same as before because they were already considered to be ideal. Third and, four, third and fourth were on both sides of the old high gear, so third was the drag heroin gear and fourth was the road gear. Reverse was the ratio equivalent of third gear, which in my opinion was too fast. The Sherman Trite step up, step down transmission was also an option. So you get eight, eight gears instead of four. And then you had the automatic depth control, which was an original feature of the Ferguson system. And you had position control under the seat. And this control was to block out depth control and cause the implement to remain at a constant position relative to the tractor, regardless of the draft. So this was great for things like a greater blade or a cultivator, etc. The draft control was used for tillage implements where depth of work automatically varied according to the certain draft forces. The price stayed amazingly low throughout production, eventually rising to about $1,200 in 1952. Other improvements was that the Ford Motor Company raised the steering wheel, put run-in boards on, and added the position control to the three-point system, like I said. The brake mechanism for the 8N was improved. So the big news was that both pedals were now on the right side position, so both could be depressed simultaneously. They had steering improvements like a recirculated ball mechanism. The new AN was basically the same size and shape as the 9N and 2N, but it had light gray wheels and sheet metal of dark red cast iron parts. So it soon picked up the name as a, you know, a red belly forward. Also, new was an air cleaner grill, as well as red Ford scripts on both sides of the hood and later also on the fenders. They also had a multi-functional panel instrument that displayed engine revolutions per minute, ground speed at different gear selections, and engine operating hours. By the time the 8N was done production in 1952, there were 524,076 Model 8N units had been produced, and over 400 implements were offered to the Dearborn Motors subsidiary. So this leads us to what I think is my personal favorite, the Jubilee which is also known as the NAA, because the Jubilee was only in 1953, and the 54 model was just an NAA. But it was the change in Ford for a number of reasons. And it had to have a bunch of different things in it to get around the Ferguson patent. So even though Ford had planned an improved tractor before the lawsuit was settled in 1952, they had to make the changes anyway because of the lawsuit. So among changes that came out was a vane-type hydraulic pump that was powered off the engine, so it meant that hydraulics were live, and since hydraulic power no longer depended on engagement of the PTO, the new styling also gave the Ford NAA a look that differed from the previous N-series tractors as well as the Ferguson TO series tractors that Ferguson continued to build. The NAA allowed Ford to market a larger, more advanced tractor than the 8N. For starters, it was 4 inches taller, 4 inches longer, and around 100 pounds heavier than the 8N it replaced. It was also equipped with a larger, more powerful overhead valve Red Tiger engine. The new inline four cylinder engine featured 134 cubic inch displacement that had a rating of 31 horsepower. Finally, the NAA, which was most often been referred to as a Jubilee, like I said, was used to celebrate Ford's 50th anniversary as a company. In fact, the first year's models carried a circular emblem on the grill that read Golden Jubilee Model 1903 1953. And the nose emblem of 1954 had a similar appearance, but the words were replaced with stars and circled throughout one border. Some of the other improvements of the NAA was the extra power in hydraulics, of course, was a better governor and temperature gauge on the instrument panel, had a muffler that was relocated under the hood alongside the engine so you wouldn't start your hayfields on fire, 
and then 1954, 100 series came out. So, you know, like Famo, like everybody else, they had the CH&M and W6 and 200, 300, 400, and John Deere had the ABH, GI, LM, R, P, Q, LMNOP, just kidding. Uh, Ford had only had one model up until now, so they came up with some different ones, which was the 600, you know, 640, 650, 800. Those were all different ones. So they had 700 series, 900 series. And the three letters were, were all dependent upon the configuration of the tractor and whether it was a selecto speed or whether it was a four speed or a five speed or it had a PPO or not. So that's enough of me yapping, and I'm just going to show you some more brochures I got before I put them up on eBay. So just uh, hang around and get through the rest of them. Thanks for hanging out with me. Here is new power on the land. Ford power, production power, earning power. Brought to you in two new Ford Red Tiger engines with a new Ford tractor model for every equipment budget and a tool for every purpose from America's biggest family of farm and industrial pick up and go implements. Year after year, Farmers have demanded more and more power on the land for an ever-growing number of uses. Back in 42, for instance, a Ford tractor delivered less than 20 horsepower at the drawbar. By 1957, this had been more than double. But Ford engineers knew that heavier tasks and still heavier implements were on the way. New jobs, bigger jobs, tougher jobs, which would demand the development of still more powerful engines for high production, high profit. Farming. The new Ford Tractor Golden Jubilee model. Here is the most advanced tractor on the market today in overall engineering and design, outstanding in performance and economy, amazing in versatility. All that is best from the past, plus much more that is completely brand new and exclusive. The most advanced hydraulic system on any tractor today. Live action with Hytro. With new live PTO. There's a new power in this tractor. Power that purrs when the going gets tough. And there's new reserve power with the new overhead valve Red Tiger engine. This is a big tractor with weight and size to balance its ample power with the proper strength and wheelbase length. This is a tractor with more comfort and convenience. Of course, it retains the famous, widely accepted, proven three-point implement hitch, which cuts down implement attaching and detaching time to an amazing degree. For instance, to detach the implement, simply detach the top link Next, detach the lower right link. And then the lower left link. And that's all there is to it. Attach an implement. First attach the lower left link. Then attach the lower right link. And from the tractor seat, attach the upper link done in less than a minute. Yes, from every angle, 
And regardless of the type of farming and the specific farm power need, the new Ford tractor has more. It's the most widely useful source of mechanized power offered to farmers today. And one of the most dramatic features, a feature that now makes it possible for a farmer to do better work, do it faster and with less effort than ever before, is the new Ford Live Action Hydraulic System. This system is an integral part of the tractor design and not only retains every operating advantage of the original Ford tractor hydraulic control system, but in addition, incorporates new features and improvements which put it far out in front of any other hydraulic system on today's market. This is a system that is really live, gives the instant kind of response with finger touch control that a farmer needs and wants with his implements, gives more power to up the tractor's capacity to do profitable work with bigger implements and heavier loads. But live action means more than that. It means a farmer today with a new Ford tractor can get lifting power any time his tractor engine is running, whether the tractor is moving or standing still, whether the clutch is engaged or not. Yes, live action does away with the necessity of time-taking, awkward and annoying gear-shifting manipulations. The whole key to this amazing advance in the hydraulic system lies in two important factors. A live pump that pumps oil at all times and the fact that this is a solid type system. Yes, in this new Golden Jubilee model Ford tractor, the farmer has the most complete Ford farming answer to his power farming needs. Whether he works land in the north, south, east or west, the new Ford tractor gives him the most... Of the